What's your lemonade stand story? He was like, YouTube's gonna be the next big thing, Dev. I'm like, you need to get on that. You need to get on it early. And I'm like, uh. And all of us, we we all go through our own trials, our own our own level of stuff. Sure, hope this works out. Otherwise, this will be a huge waste of time. <laughs> I mean, what else is it all about other than just taking risks and continuing to try and grow and hopefully yeah. make, get better and better at making things? Most of the billion dollar brands you've seen were started by people that were just solving a problem for themselves. We're telling Lemonade Stand stories from some of the world's top creators, makers, and go-getters. We're rolling, we're rolling right now, we're rolling right now. Hey, just, uh, <laughs> we're having fun, we're having fun, we're rolling. Yeah. Hey guys, this podcast today is sponsored by Yala, a task management and team collaboration software that we use at Lemonade Stand. We use Yala to keep all of our team members organized, wherever they are. In fact, we used it to plan and organize this podcast. Visit yala.team, that's Y-A-L-L-A dot team, and try for free. We also have a special offer for all listeners of this podcast. Use promo code LEMONADE and get a lifetime 25% off if you upgrade. What's going on, guys? This is Chan Prabhakar with the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast, and I'm here with Mr. Robert Payne, who is wearing a very, very fancy shirt today. Uh, I appreciate you you blessing me with that shirt that I get to look at as well as you, you know? This is uh, actually pretty standard if you're self-employed. Okay. Well, fantastic. That's that's pretty great. I need to I need to jump on that self-employed bandwagon. Um, no, you know what? It's it's actually great. We, we've been chatting a little bit, and your story has already been very fascinating to me. And I want to like just really dive in because there's so many cool things that you have told me in the last 30 seconds alone that I'm like, this is perfect. You are a perfect candidate for the podcast. Now, career-wise, you said you've been spending um, over 20 years plus as an attorney. Correct. I've been an attorney since 1999. Since 1999. And then you became a, a bankruptcy attorney since 2005, I believe. Correct. Is that right? And I think like there, just that alone, there's like plenty of stories we can like dive into a little bit. But what prompted you to? Well, I actually, yeah, go into bankruptcy attorney. And and what are some of the experiences that you've had doing that? Okay, we'll back up to the shirt first. Let's back up to the shirt. Actually, if right. I'm an attorney under forty years old, I need to wear a white shirt and tie and look professional. Yes, uh, attorneys under forty, I generally don't learn their names. I just call them Skippy. Because I figure it's not worth sense. learning their name until they have more experience. Makes sense. Once you hit 40-ish, you can start dressing more casually because people look at you and they go, oh, he's old. He probably knows what he's doing. Mm. I just turned 51. I can wear a Hawaiian shirt and shorts and still look like I'm actually competent. Yeah. It all comes down to the age. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for blessing us with your age and with the shirt. Now, for being an attorney... Generally, there's two classes of people that go into law school. Three. Yeah. There are engineers or really brilliant students who have some kind of mechanical engineering, biotechnical engineering, yeah. who decide instead of going to that field, they're going to become patent attorneys and make tons of money. That's category one. That's probably 1%. Category two are people that really want to change the world through making things better. Yeah. That's probably 2 or 3% of the people in law school. The remainder in law school... <laughs> were brilliant students who were great at English literature, poli-sci, history. Yeah. And when they graduated with their English degree, when I was at BYU, they said, IBM hires more English majors per year than they do computer science majors. Yeah. And it was true because they hire them as data entry people, custodial staff, secretarial staff. So when you graduate with your English degree, you're like, I'm great at school. I'm good at reading and writing. So do I keep going to school and become a professor? Oh, wait, I can do law school. Yeah. And that's where all the law students come from. Yes. So in law school, you then start to specialize in things you want to study, which makes no difference. Your first job determines what you actually do. Mm. I was a litigation attorney in Phoenix, Arizona, representing companies suing each other for various things. We had a company that had developed a chip you could put in your cell phone. Okay. You could put your cell phone on the table, hit speaker, and it would allow your cell phone to act as a speaker phone for everyone sitting around the table. Okay. Now, this company, they wanted to patent this idea and really run with it, 
And in the course of a week, seven of the nine members of the design team were hired by Motorola, moved to California, and all had new homes. So no we, way. this yeah. dinky little company in Phoenix, decided to sue Motorola. Yeah. Well, I I think you know who won that lawsuit. Uh, go ahead and, and, and like enlighten us. Why? Yeah. We ran out of money within okay. the first three months of the case. So I was doing litigation like that, and I was making decent money. My ex-wife had a little bit of a spending habit, spent $93,000 in credit cards in 2005. Mm. I rolled it into a second mortgage. She spent about $86,000 in credit cards the next year. And for some reason, I got involved in bankruptcy law. Yeah. I, I went to Zion's <laughs> Bank yeah. here back in Utah and asked them for a consolidation loan. And the manager of the branch said, you really need to consider bankruptcy. So mm. the first bankruptcy case I filed was my own case. Who won? Uh, it was I did. Okay. It was fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. And I realized this is something I like. It's nerdy 65 to 85 page spreadsheets helping people actually change their lives. And it's something I can do without going into court. I have yeah. never once said I object in a courtroom. Yeah. 21 years in practice. I've never said I object, Your Honor. Yeah. Which is kind of sad, but still cool. But still cool, you know. Well, the thing that's, that's interesting is... Um, you know, we, we talk about just bankruptcy in general, and it's not something that people are, like, really excited about. It's not something that they want to, like, be, they're, like, proud to be bankrupt or whatnot, right? But it's the things that happen in life sometimes, you know? It's what happens when, what, from all kinds of different storms of life, like financially, like divorce, things like that, whatever it is. But how have you been able to, like, help assist them through a part of their lives when it they feel kind of, I don't know if it's ashamed or if they feel... They, they feel everything horrible. They feel everything horrible. And the funny yeah. thing is, this has been part of our banking system for at least the last two or 3,000 years. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 14 in the Old Testament, we have the year of Jubilee. Every seven years in Israel is year of Jubilee where all debts are forgiven. This only applied from Jew to Jew so they could loan to Gentiles for usurious rates make tons of money. But we've had a bankruptcy provision off and on since Deuteronomy came wow. out. Wow. Now, that being said, no one likes to go bankrupt. If you have stuff, you lose it and it's given to your creditors. If you don't have stuff, your credit's trashed. Yeah. And you have to start over again. I take people in the most stressful time of their life and say, okay, I can put you back at zero and you get to start again. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Is it... Um, it you say it's fantastic. So how are you able to ease them through this process? Like, because do you do you feel like you have to like emotionally calm them down ever? Do you feel like you're kind of uh, like a therapist as well? This is where we have to back up. Okay. So a standard attorney wants his office to be granite steps leading up to two Doric columns. You go through the columns. There's a secretary. Yeah. And she motions to an overstuffed leather couch for you to sit on. She says. The attorney is too important to meet with you right now. Okay. Please sit for half an hour and then he'll see you for your appointment. Yeah. And that's what every attorney wants to be. That's what I wanted to be. Right. I wanted to be a banking attorney sitting in an oak lined office in an overstuffed red leather chair. Right. And what I found was people like you to actually respond to them. Mm. So yeah. I, all of my clients have my cell number. They text me constantly. Yeah. Yes, most of the questions are dumb, but they're questions that are really stressing them out. Sure. And if they get an answer, they can calm down. I'm dealing with people who are getting evicted tomorrow, or their car was just repoed last night, or maybe it was stolen. We don't know. Their home's being foreclosed because the husband died, and her Social Security just isn't covering the payments anymore. Yeah. Each of those people will cry or have some kind of breakdown with me. And it's nice that I can look at them, I can say, uh, things will be different, they will be better. Mm. and honestly you'll be okay and that's what bankruptcy is they have all of these horrible breakdowns but at the end of it they are at zero it's a big reset to zero and they can start over almost exactly yeah do you feel like any of any of the times when like people are like throwing stuff at you like this like you get way down yourself no you're never, able to like ever ever really okay how, how do you do that then well my my ex-wife she used to say, I can see one reason why polygamy would be so great. Mm. Because at least that way, there'd be someone in the house who understands how I feel. 
Okay. Okay. Well, that's, <laughs> so, that's exciting. Uh, normally, when someone is crying and sad, it bounces off me. I'm just an ore of happiness and optimism. Yeah. So it doesn't drag me down. I do stress about clients. I do make legal arguments in the shower constantly every single day. Hmm. My phone started buzzing at 7 this morning with the couple whose home was being sold out from under them. Okay. And I've been dealing with them. But no, it doesn't pull me down because I get to lift other people up. Yeah. I, I, I Well, A, that's a superpower. That is a, a massive superpower because this world is full of things that weigh people down and, and, and all that stuff. And so for you to have this ability to lift other people up, like where is your own sense and strength come from to be able to have a, that full cup so you can like lift other people up? Uh, that is honestly, as corny as it sounds, looking at the bright side. Mm-hmm. I am 51 years old. I Half my face is paralyzed right now. Mm. And I have clients who are 25 years old and in a motorized wheelchair and maybe using their breath to push the wheelchair as they go up and down the street to Target. Yeah. And I see someone like that, and I'm like, man, my life is really awesome in comparison. Sure. I have a client right now who is allergic to titanium. So when they put in her pacemaker, it made her really sick. They took it out, they put one in made of nickel. She's allergic to nickel. Oh. They put one in made of plastic. When she sneezes, it dislodges, and she has to manually push it back in with her hand. If she sleeps on her side the wrong way, it dislodges and she has to fix it. And by comparison, I'm middle-aged and a little overweight and my life is easy and great. Yeah. So yeah, I have a good life. Yeah, and well, you have this ability to see, to see things that are positive and to to uplift and, 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 uh, I don't know, bring up, I mean, now we were talking about, um, your family having like that predisposition condition to Bell's palsy. And you mentioned that after taking the vaccination that, um, I don't know if, I, I don't know, you, you ex- this condition kind of came out in you, right? Can you talk a little bit about how that all went down? Yes. So with, with the Pfizer vaccine, there's a 0.1% chance that you could have Bell's palsy, which lasts from anywhere from two days to nine months. Yeah. Nine months was the longest in the clinical studies. It's only if you have a predisposition to Bell's palsy in your genetic code. Bell's palsy basically is one nerve that runs behind your jawbone, behind your ear, that controls the muscles on that side of the face. When I got the first Pfizer shot, half my face went numb. I could no longer close my eye. Sorry, it didn't go numb. I just couldn't move it. Couldn't close my eye, couldn't smile on that side of my face. Two weeks later, I got the second shot, and everything got even worse. Okay. At nighttime now, my wife has to tape my eyes shut with sports tape so it doesn't stick to the pillow. Wow. When I kiss my wife romantically, I have to turn off the lights so she's not staring at my one open <laughs> eye. Yeah. When I yeah. swim with my kids, yeah. I have to wear sunglasses because you can try to explain to a six-year-old, don't splash daddy's face in the water, he can't close his eyes. And the six-year-old is good for one or two minutes before they forget. Before they say, hey, you know what would be awesome? Splashing daddy in the eye. Right? Now, mine has gone on for four months now wow. with virtually no change. I'm not on camera, but I am dabbing at the drool coming out of the left side of my mouth. And my left eye weeps like my grandma Irwin, who used to carry a wadded up tissue in her pocket to constantly dab at it whenever she was talking to people. See, now you're able to connect with her emotionally on a very, very deep level, you know. (laughs) And and it's not worth it. (laughs) Yeah, it's not worth it. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because um, you're you're talking about this condition and yet you still have this aura of, of brightness and of happiness. And... Even just talking to you, I, I would love to explore this a little bit more with you. You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you've had a very, very fun life, all right? And by fun, I think it means very adventurous and also very, like, ups and downs and kind of crazy and, and all kinds of stuff in between. Is there, Are there any highlights that you can give me about this fun life of yours? Oh, and gosh. What, and what has made it so fun? Uh, my dad. My dad was a giant. Now, by giant, when someone in the school ground can say, my dad can beat up your dad, hmm. I guarantee you my dad can beat up your dad. Oh my, gosh. my dad, when we buried him, was 6'9", 5'15", but 
When we tried to fit him in a coffin made for a seven-footer, his body had elongated such that we had to bend his neck sideways to fit him in the coffin. You are kidding me. With his me. feet flush on one end. So he was about 20 pounds smaller than Andre the Giant. Wow. When I would sit in front of him, I looked like a little chimpanzee in front of a silverback gorilla behind. That's just so, adorable. Yeah. Well, the, the fun thing with being that large, and, and you're a fairly large muscular guy. You probably understand this. Completely. When you are that big, no one's going to mess with you and you can always be friendly. Mm. So my dad was the big friendly guy who would joke with everyone. He would carry candy, give it to children at church. People would flock around him constantly. And that's the environment I was raised in. He had 11 brothers. All of their kids came over. It was a huge family environment. It actually gave me, let's say that God gives everyone one or two special talents in life. He gave me the most annoyingly creepy talent possible. Wow. I, small children who I don't know and dogs and cats flock to me and surround me. And it's really not great. Oh, okay. And it's especially not great when you're older in your 50s and, and still you're have sitting happen. in an office and little kids come up to you and want to sit on your lap and you're like no i don't know who you are but you look nice yeah and then you give them a piece of candy uh, yeah so i was raised with a dad who was that happy and outgoing with a mom who was crazy involved and then i even i went on a mission to south america to the tip of the Andes Mountains where we could see Antarctica from our missions. No way. So I got to see a different part of the world, came back here, law school, bankruptcy. It, it's been too much. Yeah. I, I can't even differentiate between the things. I have 11 children. Each of them has some crazy experience in their life that I get to go through. Mm. Some of my kids have made good choices. Some have made horrendous choices. And you get to navigate between all of those. Yeah. So the variety is just all over the place it it is and life doesn't slow down it's Mm. like i tell my kids it's like you're running down a mountain if you try to slow down or stop you're going to tumble and crash yeah so you just keep moving as fast as you can well uh do you know who the comedian jim gaffigan is yes um he was giving an analogy about like having kids and saying like imagine you are drowning in a river and while you're drowning in a river, someone hands you a baby. That's what he said Handing having three kids was like, you know? Well, and, and the funny thing is, yeah. my wife now, Dawn, she is amazing. Mm. She takes care of the kids, does piano in the mornings with them, picks them up from school. The little things like the house is always tidy. She's always making blankets and projects for other people. Yeah. She... I won't say she's a tiger in bed because that would be horrible to say on a podcast. Terrible. Yeah. She is just an amazing woman. And when people look at her, they assume I must be really wealthy because that's the only reason someone who looks 10 years younger than me with that level of attractiveness would have married me. Mm. And the funny thing is I tricked her. I'm a poverty law attorney. We don't make any money. We're poor. Yeah. But she didn't know that when she was dating. So she's stuck with me now. She made the choice, and now she's here. Exactly. You know? And the three kids kind of sealed the deal. And the three kids kind of sealed the deal. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I, I love this. Like, I, the, the, the variety is all amazing. So the, the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast is so focused on, you know, people's Lemonade Stand Stories. But one of the biggest things I love about it is the chance for us to talk about how we've turned lemonade out of the lemons we've been dealt with in our lives. Now, you were mentioning to me that you – can see the bright side of things and that has helped you be positive despite challenges and and trials and whatnot was there ever a point in your life where you weren't like that or was there a moment where you're like i need to uh, you know switch over and start seeing things as as bright and up uh, and upbeat no okay there never ever was so ever since you were a kid you always were positive my nickname in high school given to me by a girl in show choir named sarah greenspan yeah uh, she called me sunshine okay which if if you want a cool nickname that sounds like you're one of the big jocks sunshine's really not was not the one yeah but i lettered in chess and show choir and fencing so yeah it, it was okay sunshine went with that that went well yeah yeah. Um, so no hard moments then, like nothing that we are oh, like. Oh. Th- there have been all kinds of horrible hard moments, but yeah. there are moments that they fade, and you know tomorrow is going to be better. Mm. Like uh, my ankles, 
I have ankles and wrists built for a 12 year old girl. Congratulations. My, I'm adopted, so I yeah. don't look like my giant dad. Okay. All my cousins were the starting centers for their high school football teams. They were huge, powerful men. We would box on Sundays after church at Uncle Vern's house, and they would knock me out every time because I'm just size matters. Yeah. So with this body, I, I tried working out. I couldn't keep muscle on, so I didn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And then I married someone who I thought, I don't want my kids to have the same problems I have. So I thought, I will build on this problem, and I'll try to marry a Polynesian. There are no Polynesians right. in New Mexico. Not even one. Not even driving through New Mexico. Yeah. So I married an athlete and a bodybuilder and got huge children. Yeah. Uh, the huge children came with all kinds of problems of their own, all kinds of fun experiences trying to shop for someone at Target. Yeah. And my second time around, I married someone who didn't have big wrists and ankles, and now my kids are in gymnastics class. Where was hey. I going with that? It was a problem. It was yeah. a problem, and I built on it. Yeah. And here's what I wanted to go with that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, you're right. Tiny ankles and wrists. I broke my ankle in college. Okay. And I wanted a bowl of Rice Krispies really badly, and I wanted to go down to the basement to eat it. Yeah. So I made a bowl of Rice Krispies. And then I thought, I can hop down the stairs on my good leg, mm. balancing the bowl of Rice Krispies in my hands, and having my cast not hit the floor. And I hopped down five of the seven steps. And on step number six, twisted my left ankle badly, fell, oh spilled Rice Krispies everywhere, yeah. and I got to spend the next two weeks in a wheelchair going to class. That wheelchair in class was yeah. the most fun. If you yeah. want people to randomly come up and talk to you when you have two ankles in casts and your mom is pushing a wheelchair, that is a great way to meet people in school. Oh, man. And That's I great. still enjoyed that. Yeah. You, you, so you, you found that you found the joy in that, man. That's amazing. <laughs> it, it was a good experience. You know? Sure. Two broken ankles. Yeah. But it was, well, one broken, one badly sprained. Yeah. But it was wonderful. Dude, I love that. I love that you're able to see the positive. So now the question is going to be a little bit different. How do you help other people see life like that? I explain exactly what will happen mm. in my line of work. That's how I do it. Yeah. With... In my personal life with my children, it's a little different, but in my professional life, I tell them what we're going to do, how court's going to go, and what's going to happen to them afterwards. Yeah. And when they have an actual set line of events and they see a light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. they start to have a little bit of relief. I love that. I love that because the thing is, it's like there's no false expectations. It's just kind of like this is just what it is. And, and that's the worst because you yeah. so often want to give you give people false expectations, build them up, and then they get mad at you. Yeah. And then you get a negative review. So no, just be honest and tell them exactly what will happen and they will love you and appreciate you for it. Yeah. So right now, knowing all that I know about you, um, what would you say is the greatest source of your joy? Greatest source of my joy is yeah. easily my family. Hmm. I look forward to nothing more than going home, uh, wrestling with my sons on the trampoline, playing dolls with my daughter, and cuddling my wife while she watches some kind of home renovation show that is incredibly boring to me, yeah. and just cuddling up next to her. And, and pretending that you care about that show. Oh, no, I you do not pretend that I care. You, and I she am knows brutally that you don't. honest on Great. that kind of thing. Great. And how does she take that? Uh, I'm brutally honest. She's used to it by She's now. She's used to it now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I love that, man. I mean, that's the thing. It's, uh, I, I think like you're able to like find like those joy and happiness. How do you maintain your energy? Wrestling kids right now and, and everything. And especially when you have, you said Bell, Bell's palsy, like how do you continue to have that sense of optimism in life? Life is like running down a mountain. If you decide to stop or slow down, you're probably going to crash tumble in the gravel and get cut up and hurt. Mm. You just keep on moving. You just keep on moving. Yeah. I love that. You know, it's interesting. I um, I go I go back to India every so often, which is where I'm originally from. And a lot of times I see people that have hardly anything, physically speaking, like, it's, you know, external things. But they're just so happy. They're just full of light. They're full of joy. And I, I think, like you said, they're constantly just going and doing the thing, right? And not really, like, thinking, oh, what don't I have? They're, con they're, they're just like looking at all the positive and the bright things and, and keep moving forward. And you start realizing, oh my gosh, 
it really is that shift in perspective, right? And that shift in perspective is what helps people like keep going. And it, it's perfect because your sense of optimism is what makes you that, that great attorney because you're able to like help people during the hardest of times um, feel a bit better about themselves. And hopefully trying to get that to ooze into them a little bit so they feel a little more confident. Has there ever been a time, though, where um, d even despite your best efforts, some people just... Oh, yes, I yeah, have. One away. I think I have 87 five-star Google reviews. Okay. I have one one-star review. Okay. I did not get along with them. There's some people you meet in life who you simply don't get along with, and this was that couple. Mm -hmm. Everything I said would annoy them. Everything they said would annoy me. They, I filed two cases for them in kind of a complicated cascade of court proceedings, to get to where we finally wanted with the discharge of their debts, I undercharged them for it. And at the end of the case, they gave me a one-star review and said I was condescending, which was probably true. Yeah. I'm fairly certain I was condescending. I usually am. Yeah, good. <laughs> but I have a one-star review. And the funny thing with the Google algorithm is when you have 86 reviews, 85 positive, or 85 five-star, and one one-star, it gives you a 4.9 rating. When you hit 87 reviews and there's only one negative, it pushes you into five stars again. It does. So I do have a bad review. Okay. But it no longer affects me. Okay. Well, there you go. There and you and go. the bad review, his wife has contacted me and I've helped them again with another issue. Still didn't take down the review. Doggone it. Doggone it, man. Well, you know what? Um, I'll go ahead and add an extra review for you. You know, this podcast <laughs> has been great. It's a five-star podcast. Now well, I, but see, that's the danger. Yeah. When you start to approach 100 reviews, it looks like you're buying a bunch of canned reviews out of India. Okay. So you have to be really careful with the reviews that each one is personal, especially those later ones that yeah. come up. Because otherwise, it looks like you're just buying canned reviews. Maybe a Russian bot came in and did it for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... All right. Well, next time I write, when I write a review, it's going to be very authentic. It has to be very authentic. It'll be very authentic. Okay. So you've lived a life uh, that's full of optimism and hope despite like, crazy things. What is your greatest fear? Do you have fears? No, I really don't think you don't, I do. You don't think you do. Yeah. Because everything will work out in the end. Yeah. If I died tomorrow, we have a good life insurance policy. I'll see the family again in heaven. Yeah. Uh, I won't die tomorrow. I probably won't die till you can remove my head completely from my body. Okay. And Great. I'll probably bury most of you. Mm. But yeah, I I don't have any real big fears. Yeah. I have little fears. I stare at the phone sometimes and say, ring, ring, please ring. Business has yes. gone down 40% since the pandemic started. Uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point to think about. You know, like how, how have you been able to like survive during... 40% drop in bankruptcies in the last year and a half. Wow. And how have I survived? Stretching lines of credit, the PPP loan, SBA loans, just uh, cutting expenses and keeping everything very tight. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, it's been horribly scary and difficult. Yeah. But somehow you've been able to like make that work as well. Yeah. You know? That's awesome, man. Well, you know, here's the thing. Very rarely do I talk to people that don't really have fears, but it's it's really cool because the thing is is it's it's a very refreshing feeling. Um, a lot of the people when when I chat with them, they talk about all kinds of different things, and I realize like the world itself is kind of going through something really weird. There's so much divisiveness, you know. There's so much um, negativity and emotions attacking each other. Like, what do you think is the cure for all of that stuff? So I've been reading the 1920 Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great. Yeah. And he said if you have an argument with someone or a disagreement, instead of trying to pound them with your opinion, sit down and listen to their side and see what commonalities you have. Mm -hmm. Most of us have the same commonalities. We want the same things in the end. Yeah. We just have a slightly different perspective on how to get there. Yeah. It's And that's powerful, right? Because, you know, I've got some friends of mine that, definitely differ politically but like you said have the exact same goal in the end and they just feel like there's like just different roads to get there but when we start attaching like, tons and tons of emotion to it and like start fighting against each other because of it um that's when i think the divisiveness really 
become so strong. So how, how, how are you able to like lift other people up? I mean, this is like, not just you, just like, how does one lift other people up? How does, um, anyone like find some sort of like, you know, peace amidst all of this turmoil that's kind of going on? It's the most exhausting thing possible. It's just like with children where some people want to do quality time. Yeah. It comes down to quantity time. It's the same with people. You give them your time. And if you give someone your time and let them talk, they just have this kind of outrush of emotion and they feel better afterwards. Yeah. You have to give people time and not cut them off. I love that. I love that. I think like people are like pressure cookers, you know, and they've got like all this pressure kind of built up inside of them. And sometimes not even that they need a solution. They just need to let the pressure well, come out. They need out. to vent. I probably, I, vent. I have, oh, I'd say at least 10 F-bombs dropped on me each week. Not at wow. home. Yeah. Uh, but my wife's worst thing she'll say is generally like skittily scat. I'm not even sure what that word means, but oh she says gosh, it a lot. I can't believe she, the audacity she I would know. have. But yeah. I have probably 10 F-bombs a week dropped on me just by... Uh, opposing counsel, angry creditors, or even frustrated clients. And it just washes off like uh, water off the back of a duck. Mm. People need to vent, but you have to give them time to do that. Yeah. And the time yeah. can be exhausting because they want to say their piece. And sometimes them saying their piece takes a long, long time to go, right? Exactly. Yeah. But it is true, right? I mean, I, I feel like the more we're able to like just kind of voice out our opinion which really just comes out in the form of like pain in different ways. And the more you can do that and allow them to release, then it becomes, they become a lot more peaceful and they become a lot more relaxed. And I think that's, what's so beautiful about the profession you've chosen to go into is you're dealing, every person I feel like you're dealing with, uh, is like just filled with like the brim of, of like complete stress and, and pressure. So, and, and boy, are they. Yeah. Yeah. Every single person. Yeah. It's even better when you throw divorce into the mix or mm. criminal proceedings. There's all kinds of stress out there for people. Absolutely. But, you know, it, it's great because you are providing that safe space for people to like. Even if you don't choose it, sometimes it's like you're providing that safe space for people to like just vent and let things out. Exactly. You know? So, with all of these experiences you've had, um, just kind of like the final question, wrapping things up. What would you tell your younger self? Oh gosh, my yeah. younger self. Yeah, the younger self, like the kid. You know, I would probably say stop drinking soda. Yeah, you should. You should but, definitely stop. Look, I mean, look at this. You well, know. I was the night watchman at a Pepsi plant for four years during my undergrad. Okay. I got paid for twelve-hour shifts to guard a Pepsi plant, unlimited product while doing my homework for a bachelor's and a master's. Wow. Uh, but the soda's been bad, but man, I sure do love it. It's so good, isn't it? That would be yeah. what I'd tell my younger self. That's great. Avoid the soda. Before you Avoid the soda. Well, you know what? If that's the only thing you have to tell yourself, you're having a pretty good life, man. Well, you I know? couldn't change the others. Even with um, having uh, a marriage that failed in a divorce, I got four awesome kids out of it. Yeah. I wouldn't want to change that. Yeah. I don't want to change my career path because it's where I am today. No, I couldn't change any of it because I love where I am and what I have. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a beautiful place. Like, love what you are and, and what you have. Like that, if if people could get there, if that's like the sense of complete arrival, you know, um, a lot of people spend their whole lives chasing for that and never actually arriving. But if you can get to that point where you're like, yeah. Like, this is it. This is, I've, I've arrived. Then you feel like, well, what else is there? You know, we can just kind of hang out now. We can just relax and you can, in a sense, sp spread love and, and safety almost because um, you're, you yourself are, are comfortable. You're good. Yeah. So. yeah. Everything is good. If I died tomorrow, yeah. I'd die happy. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Robert, I seriously, I, I love, I love talking to people like you because you're like, man, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm good. Like I've arrived, and and just your energy, it's, it's great because I feel that energy, and I think that's what's so cool. I would always encourage people like get to get to that point in that in your life where you just feel so in love with yourself, not in a selfish way, but like you know, just like you're happy and you're, you're good. 
because just doing that, you you give permission for other people to do the same, even though it might take a journey for them to get there. In your case, yes, especially because other people are filled to the brim with like stress and, and worry and whatnot. But then when they're able to like finally release it and have that big deep reset and say, okay, that was brutal, but let's start over. I yeah, think that's a beautiful I have to thing. agree with you. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Robert. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. Hey, okay, thanks for having me. Yep. Thanks so much for listening to the Lemonade Stand podcast, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to be alerted when we release new episodes. We'd also love to hear your feedback in the reviews, and if you or someone you know has an awesome Lemonade Stand story, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Thanks so much, and have a great day.